Welcome to Cornwall and to a new look time team where we've assembled some old friends and some new faces and we're here to investigate a truly remarkable site that you, the fans, have voted for. We're investigating a mysterious Iron Age network of underground passageways and caverns known in Cornwall as a fugu. I've never seen an Iron Age underground chamber like that before and I just don't think it gets any better than that. It's just fantastic. It was rediscovered 25 years ago by the local farmer, Chris Hoskin. So I drove around the field and I thought, oh, bit of a hole there and went and had a look and the tractor had straddled that hole. Oh, wow. So, uh, just yeah. so yeah, I just missed it. Oh, wow. it, it. It caved away after I'd driven over it with a sand spreader. And since then, a stone-lined passageway and another cavern have been revealed. Wow, that's deep. Nobody knows what these chambers and tunnels were actually used for. Were they storage pits, places of refuge, or something more spiritual? And the team aren't just bringing their great knowledge and expertise. They've got some new toys to help us to unravel the mysteries of the fugu hidden beneath our feet. And in the true spirit of Time Team, of course, we have just three days to do it. Baden is on the Lizard Peninsula, near the mouth of the Helford River, which was once an important trade route for the Cornish tin and copper industry going back into prehistory. The Fogu is one of 14 that have been discovered in the region and is believed to have been constructed in the middle of the Iron Age, about 400 BC. Since its discovery, site director James Gossip has revealed an L-shaped passageway leading from the cavern that Chris found to another deeper cavern at the other end. We have these lovely rock-cut steps leading down into it. The team are combining traditional tools. My grandfather's shovel. The cavalry's arrived. Yeah. Ah, yeah. With cutting edge technology to get inside the fugu to help us to find out how big it is and where these tunnels lead to. John Gator's Geophys team have started early, using the latest magnetometry and radar equipment to go beyond the fugu because this site has produced evidence of occupation from the Bronze Age to the post Roman. We've got three days. What can we hope to achieve? Oh, shall I show you what we've done already? <laughs> Please, I would love to. <laughs> so, I've already done... Wow. ...some of the geophysics. Yes, we can ignore that, because that's the scaffolding oh, tower. No. <laughs> but what we're interested in are all these ditches around the Fugu. And we've got this rectilinear enclosure. We may have a, a pathway leading to the fugu here. But this is the core area of interest to start with. We're, we're hoping, because we've seen, you know, where your, where your big red <laughs> dot is <laughs> and our scaffolding, we've got a very interesting side passage to the fugu there, which we think is curving northwards and connecting, potentially, with this enclosure ditch. So what we've decided to start with is focus on the fugu. We're going to put trench one in here which is to try and see whether this big square enclosure is indeed the same date as the Fugu mm. and try and uh, connect it with it, see how it relates to it. We might find more unknown cut and covered tunnel, another extension, another passage to the Fugu. If we we're really might, lucky. yeah. The, where, uh, where we've looked at it already it is incredibly deep. So there is a chance, of course, that it descends deeper underground and becomes part of a tunnel. Matt opens up our first trench, looking for a possible passageway connecting the enclosure ditch around the Fugu to the deep cavern James found in the west. Yeah, there's a lot of this. And there's a common saying here, which is only a stone. <laughs> yeah. Adam's scanning the Fugu with his drone to create a 3D model which will allow the experts to view it virtually. Ah, uh, there we go. Look. Yeah, it's starting to change. So we're there for one quick second there, John. So the topsoil is coming off, and you can see it's just broken off there, hasn't it? And that's it. That's the beginnings of our level, and there. It's 
Stuart, our landscape archaeologist, is exploring potential trade routes from the site to the sea. But this red is basically where all the steep slopes and cliffs are, so all the way around the edge of the lizard. And Henry's found some evidence to show that the site is near one of the few landing places on the lizard. But so when you actually look in to where we are, so there's there's the site just here. Yeah. And there's the there's the um, the channel just to the north. Um, you can sort of see there are areas which you can come in. So depending on where you can harbour, the easiest route in just based on slope, not yeah. vegetation or anything else, will be taking you straight up here up to the site. But it's just so close to that. Yeah. I wonder if there is a trackway that we could find. Mm. I'll have to go back and look at the photogrammetry. And if there was trading here during the Iron Age, perhaps the fugu could have been used for storage. In Trench 1, Matt and James are beginning to see signs of the enclosure ditch and a passageway that could link deep into the Fugu chamber. James, we've gone a bit deeper than I thought we were going to go. Me too. But I think we've got an edge, haven't we? We have. It's showing up. There's a really nice yellow uh, natural, and we've got this nice brown stuff on one side, which looks like the fill. That looks pretty typical. So that's the feature that came in that we saw on the mag, right? Yeah. On the mag, on the... Well, that's what I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't know for definite yet, but hopefully it will be. And it comes down here, and we should have the enclosure ditch coming straight across here. And we stopped at this level, because look, there's that yellow natural. Yeah, so nice brown, soft fill. That should be the edge of the ditch around about there, hopefully. I think we need to probably give this another couple of scrapes, because yeah. we've got one edge there. Well, there's that yellow stuff again there. And so hopefully, it should yeah. be about there, shouldn't we? It should be. Make it very narrow. <laughs> So this is the first hint in the ground that the enclosure ditch might possibly link to the fugu. There's a very well-preserved fugu in Carn Uni in West Cornwall, which could give us an idea of what our fugu might have looked like. The tunnel at Carn Uni ends in a round chamber, which appears to have some sort of central altar. Chris, the landowner, has agreed to lift the metal cover protecting the void so that we can scan inside the Fugu chamber to see if it was a round cavern like Karnuni or a different sort of chamber altogether. It looks sort of suitably mysterious, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I'm very much enjoying the full haunted house cobwebbery. People must have lived near the Fugu while it was in use, so Carenza and John are considering putting our second trench in over a circular feature on the geophys, which might be an Iron Age roundhouse. We've talked about whether this circular feature is a hut circle or a ring ditch. Do you have any thoughts? Well, most people are thinking that it's a sort of hut circle. I mean, I don't know. James dug that and that was a Bronze Age roundhouse as far as I understand. So there's lots of magnetic noise, there's lots of rubbish mm. burning going on. This ring it's very different, it is it? certainly different. Um, it could just be uh, a barrow. Um, is that I, little dark blob in the middle could potentially be a grave, can it? Well, or... I mean, we've got to dig it. Before we can put trench two in, Metal detectorists make sure we're not missing anything in the topsoil. They discovered our first find of the dig, which might give us some dating evidence. Oh, now you can tell straight away from its green corrosion that it's got some copper in the alloy. And it's round and it's flat, so it could be a coin. And from its size and the fact that it's a copper alloy, I'm guessing that it might be, I'm hoping, that it might be a Roman coin. How amazing. What we've got to do is ask advice from Bridget, our conservator, and find out what she says we can do. I mean, generally, uh, very light mechanical cleaning yes. with some water to soften the soil should be fine. The thing I'd also like to do, um, which we've never been able to do before on a time team, is once it's clean, we can pop it 
under the portable XRF machine, um, X-ray fluorescence, but that can tell us the composition. So it will definitely have copper in it, wow. but what else does it have? It'll be an alloy with something like either zinc, which would make it a brass, or tin, which would make it a bronze. Yes. And if it is a Roman coin, then the composition, the alloy, will help us determine the denomination, because wow. some, some are brass, some are bronze. So we could work out the denomination, we could work out the period, and there's just so much that could come out of that one coin. If this really is a Roman coin, how does it relate to the Iron Age roundhouse we're hoping to find in Trench 2? James has discovered a number of Romano-British features and finds over the years, and if John and Carenza are right, there's a possibility of something Roman and possibly rare in Victor's field near the dome. Now, what we've done is we've extended the survey to the north into Victor's Field, as it's called. And we've got this square enclosure and then this sort of, it might be a Cornish round um, settlement site, but what date this is, I haven't got a clue. Well, you look at this, don't you? And the thing that immediately jumps to mind is Roman temple. Isn't it? That sort of so it's about 20 metres across, is or a temple enclosure. Yeah. That's the sort of size and shape. We've got places like Maiden Castle on Iron Age sites. But of course, we need some dating evidence from it. Uh, do you think it's a ma it looks a massive feature on the geophys, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a massive feature in the ground, no, does it? I think, it, it's, I think it's going to be a steep sided ditch. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do it to go across one of the main ditches and taking these two pits. I mean, if that is a, a Roman site, then that's going to be pretty rare, isn't it? If the location is perfect. The site certainly holds a commanding position, with connection to the sea to the north and within sight of the Bronze Age barrows of Goonhilly Downs and Ross Kruger Beacon to the south. So could this hill and the Iron Age Fugu have had a ritual ceremonial significance? It's a question that James has been wrestling with for years. This is like a rock cut tunnel. Um, it's definitely connected to the rest of the Fugu, the stone line bit. Yes. But we've got no idea what it's for, what it's doing. I don't really buy the storage idea. Um, unless perhaps it's, uh, it's the sort of commodity that was incredibly precious and, and therefore getting it out of here um, is made deliberately difficult. And now clambering over these rocks. We don't know whether these are, you know, collapsed rocks or whether they're put here deliberately to, you know, impede passage. But it would have been really awkward. Um, so now we're in this section of nice dry stone walling. Yeah, and then we come across this monster. It's one of our capping stones, one of our big capping stones that would have formed the roof of the Fugu right, Passage. Right, so this would have all been covered yeah, over. Yeah, I think yep. so. Yeah, one, one of them has fallen in and it's, and it's just been far too difficult for them to lift it out and so it stayed here for two and a half thousand years. Yeah. So I'm not imagining this, am I? It gets narrower around head height. Yeah, it looks like, uh, you can see it along this whole section of the passage. We've got this lovely stone walling, which is corbelled as it reaches the top. Yep. And corbelling is where they start to um, overlap each other to narrow the space at the top. <laughs> this feels like a liminal moment. Is this a doorway, a the, gateway the, into the a new world? passage from one space into another. Yep. Oh, well, you're, I think you're right. You've got <laughs> these two lovely uprights, um, which are a particular, you know, particularly nice, shiny kind of quartz uh, with the corbelled roof above them, or cor corbelled walls above them. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely some sort of um, entranceway. OK, but I have a question. When you look back, this now looks like a dead end. It's almost as if we're not supposed to know that there's something Yeah, and perhaps there. that's very deliberate. It yeah. is such a sharp right angle. It really is. Um, and that's really unique in, uh, you know, in Fugus. For you, is this space perhaps ceremonial? I quite like that idea because they're very difficult spaces to use in other ways. Yes. Uh, to the because modern Because you can't mind. get a cart down here You can't easily. get a cart down here. But, um, yeah, and I think there's, there's been a lot of investment in... Um, time, energy, selection of special rocks, all those sorts of things, which suggests that something a little bit more special is going on than something that's purely practical. We always suspected there was a side passage here between these two big stones. The trench got deeper and deeper. Uh, we discovered these rock cut steps and it descended into 
um, a rock cut tunnel, really lovely pick marks down the sides of the walls, and it starts to turn around, starts to curve. Uh, and we think it might match the geophysical anomaly that we're looking at now in Trench 1. So it could be one of those, uh, another access point from what would have been the open enclosure ditch into the Fugu from that direction. If I say the word labyrinthine, do you pelt me with pebbles or is it fine? No, I think I like it. So James's theory is that the rock cut chamber he was standing in connects via a tunnel with a perimeter ditch in Matt's trench, where there's an exciting development. What you got, Matt? Well, James, it's every archaeologist's dream to find a tunnel or something exciting like that, and Graham was just troweling away here, and the soil just fell away, and it looks like we've got a void or something there. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions, but we are next to the Fugu, aren't we? We are. And I can see that um, you've got the edge here of something coming along. Yeah, now that we've cleaned back, we've got a really nice edge of that feature here, which goes round towards the Fugu. And across here, we've got a lovely edge there and a lovely edge there. And we know that the enclosure ditch is, is this way, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant. So could this hole be the first sign of an entranceway into the Fugu from the enclosure ditch? Hang on. The, vo the void is basically completely filled with this soft kind of silt that's kind of accumulated off the sides, isn't it? It's difficult, until we empty that, we're not really going to be able to tell how big the void is. So we're going to have to, I think we're going to have to take the edge off, off the ditch there, and then we've got a bit more of this top stuff off. We can start yeah. exploring a bit further. This trench also gave us a nice piece of pottery. This is what we call um, Cornish Gebraik ware. And this is a flanged bowl. If you look very carefully, you can see there's a flange on the side in the seating for the bowl. Yep. So it'd have been about that wide originally. Okay. And this is specifically dates from around about the sort of third to fourth centuries AD. Okay. So the later Roman. So quite period, late, yep. But, and, you know, this is what they were making here locally out, out, out of the clay from the lizard, the, the gabbro. And they said the little white. Um, spots on the surface are feldspar crystals, and that's what makes it very distinctive. This piece of pottery was found in the spoil heap, and we're determined not to miss any valuable finds, however small. See, that looks promising already. So Naomi, our environmental archaeologist, has brought a flotation tank to search in the soil from the Fugu for the very tiniest pieces of evidence that could help us work out what was going on there. So if we get my glamorous gloves on. So this is quite a dark sample, so there's a possibility there is charcoal and things in this already, which is a good sign. Here we go. Ah, Here we go. Yep. That's a carbonised grain. Already. That's a carbonised grain. Oh, look, 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 look. Yeah, this is it. This is there. it. Fantastic. There you go, Carenza. Right. There's oh, a piece of pottery. pottery. There we are. Look at that. Fantastic. So where there's one bit, there's surely more. Tiny bits of pottery can give us dates. Charcoal and carbonised grains can help us piece together an idea of how people were living here, what they were growing and what they were eating. Pete's joined Helen in Trench 2, where we're looking for an Iron Age roundhouse. We might have found our first signs of archaeology. Well, yeah, that would, if we are on the level, they do look like possible post holes. Um, let's take this end down a bit more in line with where you already are. Post holes could indicate a fence line, so maybe we're near our roundhouse. Now that John's had a chance to look at the radar of the Fugu, he's able to travel down through the earth to see what archaeology might lurk there. So, look, there's the curve of the fence. Got it. The yep. Fugu. And this is the topsoil. Yeah. And we're going down... Through the layers. Through the layers. Yep. And so as we get deeper, suddenly you start to see the big enclosure there. Yeah. And then you start to see parallel wall lines here. Yep. You go even deeper 
features coming through here. Those parallel walls continue. A possible square enclosure there, a round feature there. We're basically seeing every two centimeters wow. into the ground. And what you realize is how much buried archaeology there is. There's it just is. so much going on. And to understand it geophysically is quite difficult. For James to understand it archaeologically, I think he's got the more difficult job. John's survey suggests features going deep into the ground. And in Victor's field, it clearly shows the square enclosure we're hoping to find in Trench 4, not far from the ground surface. Well, we started to examine this area now where this possible Roman temple, which we're referring to as at the moment, we're not sure what it is, but that's a working hypothesis at the moment. These responses on here are so strong, there's got to be something down there. Whether it's a Roman temple, that's another question. Most Roman activity on this site has been in the southernmost corner where the Manig archaeology group are working. but it's quite interesting. Oh, but it's so much easier to yes, see what it is. It is, absolutely. Just when you look inside it, you can see it's definitely pottery. They're putting in a series of test pits near to an area where they found a Romano-British structure and pits that might be burials. The team have been digging on this site since James first started working here. Lots of volunteers helped me from the local community and really they were so enthused by it all they didn't want to go away. So we formed uh, the Manig Archaeology Group in 2008, and since then we've been slowly exploring Chris's land up here. There's just so much up here and it's so complex. Uh, and obviously I couldn't have done any of this over the past 18 years okay. without them. So, I mean, they're fundamental to everything, really. 15-year-old Harvey has been working on this site for three years and has been bitten by the archaeology bug. We found lots of Gibraltar pottery, um, just in this little test pit. Right. Do you think it's coming out of a feature of some sort? Uh, I don't know yet because it's all it's all quite rocky. But yeah, I think you've got be. a way to go yet, haven't you? Yeah. One of Harvey's favourite discoveries was a shale bracelet dating to the Iron Age. The site has produced finds from Neolithic to post-Roman. One of the most spectacular is a Roman find from a Gaulish Samian ware vessel, impressed with the erotic scene of a dancer with a scarf and the god Pan. It's one of the largest found in Cornwall and dates to the latter part of the second century AD. Using photogrammetry like this, we're able to enhance detail that's hard to see with the naked eye. And we're hoping that it will help us to understand the Fugu too. By late afternoon, Adam has managed to create a model showing all the passageways that James has exposed. Landscape investigators Derek and Lawrence are trying LiDAR, laser scanning technology to show us inside the tunnels that are too small or too dangerous to access. What it's doing is firing out thousands of laser beams and it can pull those points together and create a 3D map of the Fugu. And John's testing new equipment that might not look high tech, but it allows him to see under the ground in real time. I think it's the first it's been used in the UK. To be honest, to be able to see the results on the screen instantly like this is, yeah, something pretty special. And Derek and Lawrence are feeding back all this information to Ray San in New Zealand. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Who's attempting to pull together all the data into a 3D reconstruction of the Fugu. Because there would have been the big stones for the top, the corbelling across the top, mm, wouldn't they? Absolutely. And to, to give you an idea of the sort of the, the scale of some of the stones that we get, can you see this beautiful entrance to the, uh, the, the, the tunnels here? Mm. Yep. Yeah, really big stones. Really, really big stones. I mean, that's about half a metre tall. Um, so just to wow. move those stones would have been would have been pretty good going. But to move so many is quite impressive as well. 
So Ray Sam, for your reconstruction, do we have one of us? getting pictures and scans of some of the, the repurposed fence stones and some of the lintels that are just kicking around. Yeah, it'd be lovely to reuse them actually in the reconstruction, so mm. to speak, to actually take those models of them and prop them into the, what we think yeah, is the right Yeah, take place. the fence post and put them back on top. It'll be incredible. Brilliant. And the, the floor is, is just trodden earth, is it? Yeah. Mm. Apart from here, where you've got um, stone cut steps. I don't know if you can see those, but right. th this stepping isn't an artifact of excavation. These are actual steps that have been created and cut into the rock by the uh, by the Iron Age inhabitants. So that's another entrance to the Fugu, is it? Stepping down into it? It's it's going off to another tunnel which heads directly towards Matt's trench mm -hmm. over here. So um, we're hoping to be able to find out how they they relate and how they connect up. These are great, absolutely brilliant. Adam's photogrammetry also provides the archaeologists with another way to record and examine their trenches during and after the dig. By the end of day one, Trench One is offering the exciting prospect of a new entrance and intriguing tunnels leading into the Fugu. Trench Two has a line of some post holes maybe from a fence around an Iron Age roundhouse. But in Trench 4, there's not much sign of a Roman temple. We've got our first find, a little piece of probably Victorian pottery. Not the most exciting, but it is our first. <laughs> Tomorrow, we're delving further back into the Bronze Age to a shape on the geophys that might be a roundhouse. It's next to one that James discovered, which produced a vast number of finds, including one of the largest Bronze Age pots ever discovered in Cornwall, and this extraordinary dagger. For exclusive insights, 3D models, Q&As and polls, please join Time Team on Patreon.